Good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you all to Greater Hope tonight at 5. We're excited to have you here to worship with us. We have our uh, normal round of classes tonight, although tonight we might, might need to be cautious going back and forth in the weather out there. I'll let the kids and student teachers uh, man that, but be, be cautious on the sidewalks out there. Uh, if you have a uh, bulletin, would you open up to it as we begin our service tonight? You'll see our first hymn is number 38, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. I, I've been thinking about this one this week. In fact, all three of these uh, I chose this week because I've been singing them myself and thinking about them. And this first one, uh, the last phrase has really caught me, where it says, uh, Nothing but the splendor of light hideth thee. Not but the splendor of light hideth thee. Do you ever feel like God is hidden, or His ways are hidden, or unknowable, or unknown? Well, this is a good uh, reminder that it's only the brightness of His light, not darkness, that hides Him. There is no darkness in God. When it seems like God is hidden because His ways are bad, it's really because His light is too bright for us to approach. And so if you would please stand, let's sing in praise of our great God, number 38. call to worship, which is from Psalm 33. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in Him, because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Would you join me as we pray and ask God's presence with us tonight? Oh God, we thank you for gathering us, uh, your people, on this uh, wonderful day, which has had much of sunshine and cloud and now of rain. And God, we worship you, that you are the creator and sustainer of all, that your rain is sent to refresh us, even with some cooler temperatures, and to refresh the earth uh, so that it might bring forth according to your will. God, we thank you that you are the sovereign over all, that you dwell in inapproachable light, and that, God, your ways often seem confusing or hidden to us because we cannot even look upon your light. That's how bright it is. And so today, O oh Lord, we ask that you would shine into our hearts the light of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Remind us of the gospel. Remind us of the grace that you've shown us and lavished on us. And give us, O oh Lord, listening ears and hearts that are ready to respond to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please hear now the testimony of God's grace from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the second letter, chapter 12. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses 
so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Anything in that that speaks to you this evening? Uh, Anybody in here content with weaknesses, insults, hardships? Those are hard things to be content with unless you discover uh, the great strength of God that shines out all the more in our weakness. Let's think now in this next hymn about how we come to know the great God that we sang about a moment ago. We come to know him only by the blood of Jesus that was spilled, uh, that we can gain an entrance into God's uh, heaven, into God's family through that blood. Let's stand together and sing of God's amazing love, 455. Sing along. 
could die for. Sing it again. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Seated. You'll take your hymnal, and we're going to confess our faith together. If you go to uh, number 869 or page 869. Last week we looked at the Nicene Creed. This week we start back at 1 with a shorter catechism. What a beautiful question and answer it is. It's a reminder that uh, no one's life is without purpose or meaning. And also a reminder that that purpose or meaning cannot be self-derived. You can't just come up with it on your own. It must be bestowed on you. And it has been bestowed on you by God. So I'll read the question. You respond with the answer. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen. Would you pray with me as we ask the Lord to give us that sense of calling in our lives? Heavenly Father, we adore you truly for your excellent nature and the perfection of your holiness. We thank you, Lord, immortal, invisible, only wise God, who dwells in light inaccessible, whom we cannot look upon and live. Thank you that we have been given access to you in Jesus Christ. What an amazing love, God, we are recipients of. A love that would leave heaven and enter this world in human nature, so that he might be able to die in our place and be buried dead in a tomb to taste death for us. Lord, what a wonder that we should be lifted up to your glory and that we should share with you in the splendor of heaven forever. We praise you for creating us, for calling us heavenward, and we ask, Lord, that you would continue to pursue us in Christ, that you would continue to fulfill your covenant promises and purposes. Lord, may each of us, as we go into our week, go with a sense of purpose. Stir within us, Lord, a conviction that we are called by you into our daily tasks and assignments and jobs, and that, Lord, we would not chafe against those, but that we would humbly receive those as from your hand, and that we would seek a way to glorify you in it. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking that our lives are merely thrown at random into the world, aimless and without uh, enjoyment. God, please take away from us any such thoughts. Tonight, we pray for anyone who finds themselves in the slew of depression or despondency. God, that you would lift them out, that you would fix their eyes on something higher, and that, Lord, you would open up, as it were, the very door of heaven to show them the light streaming out from your presence. Lord, give us swift feet to serve you, God, at home, in the community, at work, at school. And please, Lord, establish the work of our hands. Lord, may each person here find encouragement in their work this week and good success. And may they, Lord, be able to return thanks to you for all that you give them. Lord, thank you that your gifts and callings are irrevocable, Lord. Help us to remember this. And God, daily, please feed our heart with grace, with this sweet truth that Jesus did it all, and therefore all to him we owe. Lord Jesus, take us, all that we are, our minds, our bodies, our wills, Lord, our hearts and affections. Take them as your own because you bought them with a price. We pray this in Christ's name and for his glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our sermon text tonight, or our scripture passage, is Psalm 119, verses 137 to 144. You can find this in the Black Bible on page 483. Tonight's lesson is brought to you by the letter Tsadi. Tsadi. That's a good one to say. That's a fun one to say. Tsadi. And here, uh, David is going to focus particularly on 
God's righteousness as it matches up with his need. And that's what we're going to be speaking about today, how the Christian heart is a well-matched heart. Let's look together. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever and your law is true. Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. This is the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. All right, all of our three classes are dismissed at this time. Our elementary can come down to the front and then middle and high school to the back. I think everybody knows where they're going. Excuse me, boys and girls. All right, let's look together at these verses and think tonight about how a Christian's heart is well matched with God. Uh, when's the last time you attended a wedding? Can you think about that? When's the last time you attended a wedding? When you got married? When you got married? <laughs> All right, it's been a while. You're, you're due, John. You're due to attend one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I get to attend maybe more than most. Uh, as, a, as a minister, of course, one of the privileges is getting to, from time to time, officiate weddings. And so I've been to quite a few. And um, I also enjoy my vantage point at weddings. Uh, I get to be on this side of the, of the equation. And I get to be very close to the man, the, the bridegroom, as the bride comes down the aisle and as they link hands for the first time in the ceremony, the father giving her hand to the groom, usually how it goes, and they look into each other's eyes. What a privilege. Uh, not many people get to see that that up close except at their own wedding. And very often at those weddings, I think, usually I, I've counseled the couple for several weeks ahead of time. Usually I don't, I don't do weddings unless they allow me to do that. And so I know them well, and sometimes I'll think, this is a perfect match. Perfect match. I mean, they could not be better matched than these two people. I think in this section, uh, all uh, beginning with the letter Tzadi in Hebrew, David is trying to express something like that about his relationship to God. Uh, he believes he has been brought into the kind of relationship with God that you could compare to a wedding. You could compare it to a marriage. He has been married to God. And he believes for some very important reasons that his marriage to God is a perfect match, a well-matched relationship. Although it might be for different reasons than we imagine. So that's, that's going to be the fun tonight to think about why David believes he's well-matched to God and God is well-matched to him and why we can also believe that. Now, a word really quick about structure. This is one of the, to me, one of the more fun uh, of the stanzas because the structure is very, I think, very complex. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this word, but a chiasm. This is the word. Yes, I know Ben's heard about it. He's excited about it. A chiasm is a poetic structure that a poet will sometimes use where the uh, lines at the beginning and the end, it's kind of like a, I'm going to use a sports analogy because I love sports too, it's like a bracket, like a March Madness bracket, right? The, the first seeded teams play the last seeded teams and then the middle seeded teams play the other middle seeded teams. A chiasm is like that. The first line uh, of a section tends to correspond with the first line of the next section way down at the bottom and then the second line with the second line in the next section and so forth creating this kind of 
uh, pleasing structure that helps you get a sense that this person has fully grasped and thought about and arranged his thoughts uh, in an artful way. And so if you look at the, the uh, passage, there are two halves to it, and each half kind of brackets off with each other. Uh, 137, that first verse, pairs with the first verse of the second section, 141. And then verse 138 pairs with 142, and 139 pairs with 143, and 140 pairs with 144. You get the picture, right? There's this bracketing of the verses. Now, I'm not trying to bore you with literary details, but this will be important as we go through my outline because I'm going to be, it's going to feel like I'm jumping around a lot more this week than I normally do, but that's the reason why, because I'm covering it as, it's, as it corresponds according to the chiasm. Everybody say chiasm. chiasm. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> You're like, no, it's not. Stop being an English teacher and let's talk about the Bible. All right, we'll do it. Uh, here's the uh, outline today. First of all, we're going to see the tie that uh, David is excited about, the match between God and himself. Uh, secondly, we're going to see the test, and lastly, we're going to see the triumph. Uh, who is a perfect match for God? Why is it difficult even for them to relate to God? And then, how do we overcome the difficulties in our relationship with God? So let's look, first of all, at the tie, the perfect match. In verse 137 and in verse 141, he describes him, uh, God first, and then he describes himself so he's bringing together two people there in those two verses and showing how those two people are perfectly made for one another. God and himself, uh, the Lord and the believer who is in a covenant relationship with him. Uh, first look at verse 137. He says about God, uh, first of all, that God himself is righteous. God is righteous. Now what does it mean for God to be righteous? This is important. What does righteous mean? Blameless. That's right. Kind of like we spoke about in the hymn, about the hymn earlier. There is no darkness in God, only light. God is righteous. All his ways are right. Now, it's easy to understand how a person can be deemed righteous. How do you judge a person to be righteous or not righteous? A human, according to the Bible. How do we know a person's righteous or not? Based on something else. Based on something higher than them. Based Well, based on God's revelation. Well, here's a question for you. How do you judge God is righteous? Yeah, right. That's right. Um, there is somewhat of a, you kind of reach the bottom there. You know how when you're, you know, when you're building a, a building, you build it on a foundation, which is based on a bigger uh, foundation and a bigger foundation. But, but eventually you'll reach a point where you can't go any lower, like the core of the earth. You can't explain what makes something steady by going any deeper than the core of the earth, right? And so with God, when you get to God, you can't explain how he's righteous by going any deeper than just simply saying God is righteous because he is consistent with his righteous self. Which seems a little bit circular, doesn't it? Like God is righteous because he is righteous because he is righteous because he is righteous. But this is one of those things that gets you to the mystery of God, right? God is mysterious in so many ways. Past our understanding, he dwells in light inapproachable, hid from our eyes. The righteousness of God is defined not by anything outside of himself, but only by himself. However, we can judge God to be righteous based on his own rules of righteousness, which is also how we judge whether we are righteous or not. That's why David says in verse 137, Lord, you are righteous, and therefore right are your rules. This makes sense. A righteous God produces righteous rules. And so human beings are judged as to whether they are righteous or not based on God's righteous rules. 
And in a way, we can also determine or understand at least or accept that God himself is righteous because his character is consistent with his rules. Right? Except there's one hitch here. God is not righteous because he conforms to rules. We just know him to be righteous because he conforms to rules. The rules themselves are conformed to God. That's what's being taught to us there in verse 137. God, because you are righteous in and of yourself, when you speak a rule, it is automatically a righteous rule. You can give no unrighteous rule. You can give no unfair rule because that's who you are. Now, I want you to think about that. You could, by the way, do this about any of his attributes, not just righteousness. But I want you to, for a moment, maybe get a little bit lost in the immensity of that. What is it to be a being whose only rule is himself? And yet, that is the most perfect rule that you could ever have. In fact, himself, he is the basis of all other rules. Wow. What a God. Isn't that right? There is no darkness with you. There's no shadow of darkness or of turning. God, you are light, all light, righteous in and of yourself. Man. Now think about it. Who could be perfectly matched to a God like that? Imagine you're at God's wedding. God is the, is the groom. He's getting married. Who in the world is going to be able to come down that aisle and be perfectly paired with this God? Whose righteousness is the core of the earth of righteousness? Who can measure up? What do you think? Got any names for me? Somebody he has made righteous. That's right. Someone he has made righteous with his own righteousness could attain to being perfectly matched with God. Here's how David says it. Remember I said there's a chiasm here. There's a bracket. Here's where it matters. Now I'm going to jump to verse 141 because it's the corresponding verse to 137 in the structure. Here he describes himself. How does he describe himself? I am small and despised. Completely insignificant. And for David, this does not mean, well, therefore, I'm not a good match for God. God and I can never go together. Righteous are you, Lord, and righteous are your rules. I am small. I can have nothing to do with you. Instead, he spends this whole section talking about how because he is small and despised, and because God is righteous in and of himself, therefore, perfect match. God's inexhaustible supply corresponding perfectly with his Deep need. Do y'all see that? Who is a perfect match for God according to the gospel? The person who recognizes that they are not in themselves a perfect match for God at all. The person who judges themselves to be in God's sight and compared to God, but a small speck of dust. In a way, despicable. That's what that second word there is, despised, despicable. Uh, I, I am darkness. God is light. What could darkness possibly have to do with light? And yet, by admitting that, David opens himself up to what Mike said, to being righteous by the righteous one, to being declared and made righteous by the God of all righteousness. At the end of the Bible, there is a picture of God's wedding. In the book of Revelation, do you all remember that? The marriage supper of the Lamb? Let me give you a quiz on the marriage supper of the Lamb. What is the bride wearing 
at the marriage supper of the Lamb, at the very end of the Bible. Quiz. About the, I'll make it easy. What color is her dress? <laughs> okay, white. There you go. White. Bright white. And you might remember, what does John say about that bright white dress? What does it stand for? The righteous deeds of the saints. Who is that bride? The church. Now, most people in history have looked at the church on earth and thought, oh, really? White robe? Spotless deeds of the saints? I'm not so sure that God has a bride worth having. Most people have thought that. And yet, the Bible's very stubborn about this. God is going to ensure on that great wedding day that his bride has been perfectly outfitted for the occasion. That she has received a righteousness that will pass muster. She has been able by the Spirit of God to do works, many good works in God's grace that will one day deck her out so that she can go down the aisle and take the vows and be forever married to the Lord God himself. God has stooped all the way down to take people like us Weak people, sinful people, and make us his bride. Therefore, in your weakness, in your smallness, in your sin even, you are a perfect match for God. Good news or bad news? I think good. I think cr tremendous news. Tremendous news. I, I don't have to make up my own verse 141. I don't have to say, okay, Lord, you're righteous and righteous are your rules. And I am, well, not quite so bad as other people. I don't have to do that. I don't have to say, I am someone who tries hard at least. No, I can say fully, completely, honestly, I am small and despised. And yet perfectly matched to the Lord because he's the one of all righteousness who is able to, to, to make that dress, to make that white robe that one day I'll get to wear and that one day you'll get to wear. God has condescended all the way down, being willing to make a covenant of grace with a very weak, sinful, yet dependent people. Now, suppose David didn't think this way. Suppose instead of saying, I am small and despised, he would say, oh, well, I'm not half as bad as Saul or something like that. Would he be qualified? Would he be a perfect match in that case to the Lord? No, he wouldn't. See, actually, the only way to not be a perfect match to God is to refuse the grace offered and to pretend like you don't need grace at all. Contrary to popular belief, mo most people think if I'm going to be good enough for God, it's got to be some great thing that I accomplish on my own. Contrary to that, to be a perfect match to God, you must simply bring your weakness and your need with a willingness to receive the gracious gift of his supply. Anybody in here amazed by God's love that he would marry people like us? Now, secondly, let's look at the test. Uh, every marriage or every match is tested. Uh, when I stand up before the congregation with the bride and the groom, that is the easiest time for them to stand and smile at each other. How long before that smile gets tested? What's the estimate? Are we talking minutes, <laughs> seconds, days? I mean, it depends, right? Very much depends on each couple. It could be very quickly. But at some point, we all know it, it's going to be inevitable. That commitment is going to get tested through very difficult things. 
David is glad to be perfectly matched to God, but he finds himself, you can see in, in verses um, 138 and 143 especially, he finds himself in very trying circumstances as he lives for the Lord. In fact, he finds himself there because he is seeking to live with his God. Because he wants to live out this marriage that God has made between himself and David. Uh, first of all, in verse 139, look at that. What struggle does he have? One thirty nine. What, what's the problem there? My zeal clashes with what? Their forgetfulness, right? So there's me. There, there, I am married to the Lord. I believe I'm small and despised. God has come to me graciously, forgiven my sins, and brought me into a relationship with Him. And I am zealous for God. Jesus paid it all, therefore all to him I owe. Let's go out and live for the Lord. I am zealous. And then he gets out there and most everybody else, especially those who are against him, don't care a thing in the world about anything David is talking about. They forget God routinely. And when they do remember him, it's usually to scorn him or to make life difficult for David. David is a fish out of water. Because of the zeal that he has for the Lord. Now, this is a zeal, by the way, he received from God. God gave him this zeal. And so the Lord, when we have a relationship with him, almost makes it to where life becomes more difficult, or at least difficult in different ways than it was before. You can see a similar thing in verse 143. If you look at it, there's another aspect to this trouble that David describes. How does he describe it there? Trouble and anguish. What have trouble and anguish done? Overtaken me. Yeah, some translations say they've overtaken me. Uh, others say they, I love this one, they found me out. Trouble and anguish found me out. Has trouble ever found you out? Has anguish ever found you out? Why do you think he puts it that way? They found me out. Things were, going well. Things were going well. I wasn't expecting it, or at least not exactly the way that it happened. And then, <laughs> jackknifed, you know, T-boned. That's right. I've been praying. I've been praying. I've been ordering my life in a certain way that I wouldn't have trouble and anguish. Doesn't everybody who's wise want to do that? Of course, we're all trying to do that. And yet, listen, it will find you out. It doesn't matter whether you're looking for it or not. It'll find you out. Some people look for trouble and anguish, nearly, <laughs> Right? Because they've ordered their lives in such a way that it's like on a collision course with trouble and anguish. But even those who don't look for it will find it. Have you ever noticed that? Why do you think it is that trouble will find you out? true yep part of it yep what else we live, here. we live here yes our address happens to be planet earth and earth post fall post sin and misery and so yes that makes it inevitable that trouble and anguish will find me out now notice he has zeal for god no one else does it makes him feel very out of place he delights in God's commandments. He's found this new sense of joy, like we talked about last week, this new sense of joy in what God has said and what God is doing. And yet, all the time, even though he's got this delight in his soul, he's running up against trouble and anguish all the time, finding him. It turns out being married to God is not easy. Being 
being married to God will test you. Uh, think about the Old Testament saints. Which of the Old Testament saints, besides David, experienced exactly what David is describing? By the way, you could just about name any of them. But let's start with somebody that comes to your mind. Joseph. Oh, man. He was the only one, of course, in Potiphar's house that loved the Lord. And remember what he had to do out of love for the Lord. He had to flee from Potiphar's wife and take a false accusation from her. Wow. He was doing everything right, and trouble found him out, and he found himself in prison. Man. Who else? Daniel. Abraham. Elijah. Jeremiah. You really could list them all. Their zeal put them at odds with the world around them. It made them feel very out of place. And the joy of the Lord that God had given them was tested severely by adverse circumstances. When have you felt most out of place? Like really out of place, like me in a room full of dogs. <laughs> I feel very out of place, very uncomfortable. How about you? Well, as a Christian, there's a really real sense in which as long as our address is on planet Earth as it is, we are going to feel out of place and that is not a sign that we're doing something wrong. With all the caveats that I just said about some people live to seek trouble and anguish, don't, you know, we're not excusing that. But in general, when we seek to live for the Lord, it will find us out. Our very delight in the Lord internally will come up against external pressure and external opposition all the time. We should not be caught off guard by this. Everybody will face bitterness, sadness, anguish, trouble, uh, some type of opposition or persecution that just breaks your heart. Everybody at some time will face this. Guess what? We can add Jesus' own name to the list we were listing earlier. God did not spare his own son from this. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. Agreed? Why did Jesus experience sorrows? Why was he acquainted with griefs? Well, for the very same reasons that David is describing here, except for Jesus, it was like a million times more exposing because Jesus had a perfect heart for the Lord. David didn't. He had only an imperfect heart for the Lord. The more true your heart is to God, the more out of place you will be in this life and in this world. Jesus knew the atmosphere of heaven. Think of how bitter it felt to have trouble and anguish on earth find him out. And yet God didn't spare him. And also, Jesus did not sink into the depths of utter depression and despondency because of it. Now notice, I didn't say he wasn't sad. You know, I didn't say he didn't have anguish. True feelings of anguish, I'm sure he did. But he did not sink into the depths with it. Why? He knew why he was here. Jesus came to make this marriage with God, this match with God between us and him, a reality. And so he knew. He actually set an example for us of how to deal with the difficulties that come in our relationship with God in a way that doesn't break us or overwhelm us. And so let's look at this last thing. This is the third thing, the triumph. How do we overcome these difficulties? Jesus shows us the way. David also describes the way in this song. Have you ever done or remember doing a, one of those puzzles on the back of the cereal box? 
Like a lot of times they'll have a maze. It, I, I don't know how old I was when I realized that on the side of the box, it showed you how to do the maze. Y'all know? Showed you all the answers on the side, usually right down at the bottom in small letters. Yeah, upside down, you have to, you got to flip it. Yeah, that's right. But when you discover that, doesn't the maze become a lot easier? <laughs> that's the thing about mazes, right? They're very difficult until you realize the trick, until you realize the, the key. Well, it, it is a maze in many ways to live in this world married to God with all these, this zeal that's frustrated in, in us because of other people's lack of zeal, this um, uh, trouble and anguish that are always stalking us. This can be very difficult, like a maze. And yet David traces for us the way out. It looks a whole lot like Jesus and what Jesus did. I want you to look now at several verses as we go through. Verse 138, if you'll look at that. Uh, verse one. 40, you may want to circle these, 142, 144. These are the verses where he describes the key. He's well matched with God, yet it's not easy being well matched with God. But here is what he does. For example, what does it say in 138? God, I look to your testimonies. The testimonies you have appointed, they are my guide, they are my compass. Verse 140, he says something of the same, in the same way. My zeal consumes me, my, fo my foes forget your words, but your promise is well tried. And your servant loves it. Now think about that. Two verses that sort of sandwich that middle uh, idea of my zeal consumes me, but everybody else has forgotten you. Uh, what do we normally do when we have zeal for something, we're excited, and everybody else is a wet blanket? Have you ever had that? I'm excited, and everybody's like, mm, sounds lame. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. What do we, what do we almost automatically do? Yeah, oh, well, maybe it is. Whew, sorry I said it. I'm embarrassed now. Isn't that right? We normally retreat. That's one of the first things we do. And that actually is so common in the Christian life. When we face opposition, it can be the subtlest opposition. I'm not just talking here about all-out like physical persecution, although obviously it would apply. I, I mean just you are excited for Jesus and there's people around you that are wet blankets. That's all. When we have that, usually we wither under that kind of lack of enthusiasm. And we begin to become chameleons. We try to blend in. We try to match the people around us so that we don't feel so out of place and so embarrassed. Now, I want you to notice the opposite of David. What does he do? He's excited about God's word. He shares it with people, and they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot those. I forgot all about that. It's not a big deal. And David says what? I'm going to love them even harder. I am going to get more excited about God's word. I'm going to double down and triple down. Because, God, you've appointed your testimonies in your great righteousness. The righteous God who makes righteous rules. I know your promise is well tried, and so I'm going to keep loving it. I'm not going to wither under the opposition that I'm facing in loving your commandments. I'm going to love it more. Wow. Now that's a field guide for how to handle this kind of thing. Jesus models it better than any. Think about a time when Jesus doubles down on his love for God and his word when everybody else is naysaying. Can you remember? Garden of Gethsemane. Remember the other disciples? Oh, come and pray with me. It's time to pray. What do they do? Ah, yeah, we don't really need that. I'm tired. Wet blanket, right? What does Jesus do? He goes and prays harder. Wow. 
Many, many such cases. Very, very important to remember that. Now look at the next place. When trouble and anguish find him out, notice there in verses 142 and 144 what he says. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Your commandments are my delight. Give me understanding that I may live. When trouble and anguish find us out, what do we tend to do? We're doing the right thing. We're praying. We're, getting, we're trying to follow God, and all of a sudden, boom, trouble and anguish. What do we do? Oh, woe is me. This is going to last forever. I'll never get out of this. My life is lost. Right? More than anything else, it has the power, trouble and anguish has the power to zap our enjoyment of God and of our confidence in the greater eterna eternality, the greater uh, eternity of God's ways and God's self compared to the stuff of this life. And yet notice David. Trouble and anguish find him out, but he remembers God's righteousness is forever. This trouble is a lot, but it's only for temporary. It's only now. There's a beginning. There's an end. It will come to a close. But God, your righteous rules will never come to a close. Your righteous character never changes and will never stop. He says the same at the end. I'm going to delight in your commandments because your testimonies are forever. Forever. And so Jesus, when he faced the cross, it says he did so for the joy that was set before him. Instead of letting trouble and anguish upset his idea of eternity, that there was something that lasts forever that he was aiming at, Instead, he doubled down and said, I'm going to forget this temporary by looking at that eternal. I'm going to look at the joy that the Father has planned for me and for my bride forever, and I'm going to endure the now by seeing that, by seeing what never stops. That was Jesus on the cross, doing the very same thing that David is describing right here. Paul says, don't you know, that this temporary suffering is working for you an eternal weight of glory. He's doing the same thing. He was saying, look, what do I know? I know I've got trouble and anguish. But what do I know about that trouble and anguish? It started. It had, a, it had a moment where all of a sudden it happened. It came into existence. Well, if it came into existence, I know it's going to go out of existence. But what do I know about God? God never started. Amen? God never started. That's a thought to blow your mind. He never began. And so the God who never began will never end. Therefore, God outweighs this. I can still delight in God in trouble because I've got something worthy of delight. Okay, this is not just Jedi mind tricks. This is not just uh, playing games with your brain here. This is real. God really does outweigh trouble. Clint? Yeah. That's right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That is exactly what the way the Bible puts it. Yeah. In fact, what we're reading tonight, the Spirit of Christ gave to David. A thousand years before the cross. Isn't that amazing? Because again, Christ, like God the Father, is eternal. He was before 
He always has been. He always will be. And so his way outweighs anything within this present short, as the Bible calls it, this short life that's like a vapor. And that applies for the good things and it applies for the bad. So when you're staring at the maze, that is life sometimes, and you can't work out how to get out. I'm caught in this corner or that corner. I don't know where to go. Turn the box over and on its side. Let the Spirit of Christ, speaking through the Psalms, speaking through the Scriptures, teach your heart what to do. It's very, very common for anguish and trouble and the wet blanket effect to just depress us. And some are more prone to depression than others, right? But all of us can get there. Let the Spirit of Jesus show you the eternal God, the one who's righteous, therefore everything he does is righteous, therefore righteousness is righteousness, right? Because he defines it. Let that, the immensity of God outweigh whatever it is that might be undoing you now. You are, as a believer in Christ, well matched with God. Precisely because you're a person of need. Not in spite of your need, not, uh, you know, as if you don't have need. No, because you have need, you're well matched to Jehovah, the living God. He loves to walk with needy people. Isn't that something? Isn't it? That means with Paul I can say, look, I boast in weaknesses. Insults? Bring them on, I boast in them. Why? Because his strength shines in my weakness. Look again at David's two statements. This is where we'll close. Verse 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. Verse 141. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. That's a match made in heaven, y'all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace, Lord, that you have so uh, committed us to, to yourself like a bride for her husband. And Lord, that you love us in our weakness. You meet us there, Lord, and supply all of our wants, all that we lack. Lord, I do pray, especially for anyone tonight whose heart is just heavy and weary, anyone who may be sinking into a depression or a despondent state. God, we've, we all get there, we've all been there, but we pray, Lord, that we would, by the Spirit of Christ, turn the box upside down and sideways and see the way things really are, the eternal God in comparison to this temporary moment. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome back, kids. Perfect timing. Our last hymn tonight is going to be a hymn of confidence. The first line says, How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Let's stand together and sing How Firm a Foundation, number 94. to 
supply The flame shall not hurt you I only design Your dross to consume And your gold to refine Even down to old age All my people shall prove My sovereign eternal unchanged shall still in my bosom be born. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake It is a good match indeed, amen. Please receive tonight the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that through the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Thank you for being with us tonight. Go in his hope this week.